Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. If there's one group of people that really pull at my heartstrings and in many ways was the motivation for this podcast, it would be men and women divorced or widowed over 50. I mean, what epitomizes heartbreak and hope more than looking for love over 50? You know, the fact that I am one of these women really hit home. I've shared with our audience that my marriage ended when I was in my early 50s, and it was extremely hard to re-enter the dating world. 10 years later, I raised my children, didn't date, and then I was in my 60s. And I'm a pretty positive person, but it was heartbreaking, and it was rough, and it was challenging. Author Francine Russo and her book, Love After 50. Well, when I saw that book existed, that was music to my ears. Francine's also the author of There, Your Parents Too. She has a PhD in English literature. And as a journalist, she focuses on psychology, relationships, and social trends. She's written for virtually every publication from the Atlantic to the New York Times. Francine's own story is she has two grown children, three adult stepchildren, and eight amazing grandchildren. And she is really a living, breathing example of the unbelievable potential that we all have to transform ourselves with the people we love at any age. So welcome, Francine. What a wonderful introduction. Thanks so much. And I do feel like I am an example. And my friends tell me I'm an inspiration to them. Well, you are. The first thing I did when I read your book, I was stunned by the preface. You have two wonderful marriages. Both yes. your husbands pass. You find yourself a woman of a certain age. You re-enter the dating world. And now you have a wonderful partner, Michael. I want to know, before we dive into your book, your studies, how did you have the strength? How did you have the optimism? How did you have the energy to, in your 60s, I believe, go out and look for a partner after losing two really good husbands? Where did that come from? Probably my father. He was optimistic and joyful. And um, I've always had a certain kind of optimism. And I'm also, I know I'm more happy partnered than not partnered. And although I learned how to be on my own and I got pretty good at it, it's not my favorite way to be. I love sharing my life with someone and that gave me the courage to do it. Not just that, in the 10 years between my two marriages, I learned so much about myself, about how to date, about finding the kind of person I wanted. And so After my second husband, Chris, died, I didn't jump into dating right away as I had done with Alan, my first husband, because with Alan, I was just so scared to be alone. And I wanted to reassure myself I wouldn't be alone. And I did do that. But there were a lot of things that I had to learn about myself to find the right partner. I had a lot of failed relationships. They were not all failures. They lasted a certain amount of time. And then I said, okay, I want something like this, but better. So when Chris died, I did not date for four years. I'm How old. old were you when Chris died? I was 60. Wow. And I was writing my first book and his, his children we're now motherless and fatherless. And I was the, uh, the stepmom. I was the only parent in their lives. And I devoted a lot of my energy to them, which is wonderful because we have Thanksgiving together every year. It's a gigantic five children, eight grandchildren. It's terrific. We're a real family. But when I was ready to date, I knew I was ready because I'd been through it before. And I also knew exactly how to go about it. So I didn't take years and years and years. I probably had 10 or 15 first dates. I had somebody I dated for a couple of weeks and I realized we had very different ideas about monogamy. And then I met Michael and we had some issues to work out, but he was the one. And so it didn't take me long at all. And I knew that it would not because I knew how to do it. So Francine, you said something that's interesting to me. You write about love after 50. And just by writing about it, there's almost this assumption, perhaps the wrong word, that people want to be in love after 50. You talk about being happy partnered. Do you think that's 
true for most people? Do you think there's a benefit to being partnered after 50? You know, what are your thoughts about that? Because there is a presumption that, you know, everybody wants to be in love. I think people do better with a partner. I think it's more motivating. I think it's more fulfilling. But but there is a presumption in your book that people do better partnered. Well, first of all, I've written my book for people who want to be partnered. But I do acknowledge that there are some people who are so happy finally being on their own and taking care of themselves and having exactly the life they always wanted and the independence and having a full social life. Those people are not my readers. Well, there's a lot of studies I know about people, health benefits of having a partner. Do you think that's valid? Yes, I do. I've I've read a lot of those scholarly studies because I do a lot of writing for Scientific American. And I, in fact, have written about loneliness. And I've seen many, many studies saying that there are reasons. But there are women, especially, who have sublimated all of their needs to their partners, to their children. But they're not lonely because they have so many friends. They do have children. They do have grandchildren. Their lives are full and rich. And I think that those people, if they're happy that way, then that's absolutely fine. I don't prescribe a partner for everyone. You know, loneliness is such an epidemic, we all know. But you raise an interesting point. Loneliness could be fulfilled by many things, family, children, community. I think community matters so much, particularly after we've gone through the last few years that we've gone through with COVID. But your book talks about fulfilling loneliness or living your life partnered, truly, as I call, well-yoked. And that's a different kind of love and a different kind of fulfillment of loneliness. Well, it's not a fulfillment of loneliness, it's fulfillment. Partnership does many things. It doesn't just keep you from being lonely. It enriches your life. It expands your life. You and your partner help each other grow and become better people if it's a good relationship. One of the things that you speak about in Love After 50 is if you're going to look for a partner, look for love, you talk about preparation and you say, you know, you got to get in shape and you're not talking about physical shape only. You're talking about emotional, psychological, doing the head work. So can you tell us what your thoughts are about getting in shape and being prepared? Yes. When I was first widowed, I was actually only 46. And six months after my husband died suddenly and shockingly, and my children were still nine and 15, I secretly, for my children, plunged into dating. My marriage was wonderful in many ways, but it didn't fulfill my ideas of romance. And I wanted romance. And I found this guy who romanced me. And that was really great for a few months till I found out that he was keeping a mistress. He was a no good in lots of ways. And that was disappointing and a little bit heartbreaking. But I also realized I was not ready, that I had to, I was running away from my grief. And the first thing I had to do was heal. I had to grieve for my marriage, for what I lost. And I had to feel optimistic and I had to feel grounded and not desperate because I was, in fact, kind of desperate. My friends would say, you know, desperation is not very attractive when you go on a date. And I would say, but I am desperate. Which is why somebody that you met who romanced you could pick up on that and feed that need for romance that you probably showed. So that's interesting. As you started dating, you sort of picked up from whomever the things you needed. So that gentleman said, aha, I need romance. And it highlighted it for you, correct? Maybe that's what happened. But I also think that had I been a little more grounded, had I been less desperate, I would not have fallen for this guy's phony charms. And I spent a lot of time learning how to be okay on my own. And one of the things, I'm not a hobby person. I I read books, you know, but people said, oh, you know, do your hobbies. But I don't have any hobbies. I did love to travel and study languages. And on a trip to Amsterdam, I rented a bike for two weeks and I rediscovered my childhood love of cycling. And when I got back to New York and this was before the era when there were bike lanes everywhere, I bought a bicycle and I was working at the Village Voice then. It was five miles from my house to the Village Voice. And I rode there along the river every day through parking lots. And, and I loved it. And I joined bike clubs. And when I was on my bike, 
I didn't need anybody else. It just felt fabulous. The wind in my hair, just finding something I could love without needing anybody else really, really helped me. And my bike rides became longer. I cycled from Manhattan to Brooklyn to Coney Island, which is 20 miles. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Walked along the beach. Was that part of your preparedness? Yes. I wanted to be less needy, less desperate. So that was also also physical preparedness too. Gotcha. You were probably in good shape already, but there's a physical preparation and emotional preparation being less needy. And when my marriage ended, I went into really good therapy. I don't know how else to say it. You know, I, I just thought, well, I'm in my fifties. I guess I really have to figure out what the hell's been going on. And, uh, it was transformative for the first time in my life. I really took a hard look at things. I realized that I was the only person who really cared about my story being known. Nobody else really was interested after five minutes. And (laughs) I realized that I had to do the work. So I think Therapy, maybe not for everybody, is a really good way to get prepared. Oh, I do too. I also was in therapy. I had an excellent therapist who helped guide me to do the things I needed to do for myself and and also through some of the early relationships where I would get angry and keep, if it didn't end the way I wanted, and keep playing it over in my head. And he would say, you haven't let it go. If you're still fighting with him in your head, you're still in it. And that was like a really important thing to learn. So I had I had to learn to let go when it was time to let go. And I think one of the things that we learned from therapy, which is something else you speak about, is know what you're looking for. And I know my journey through therapy sort of eliminated what I wasn't looking for and what I was looking for. So I was able to come up with a list of desired traits. I've spoken with an author, Dwayne Welch, on this podcast who talks a lot about a desired traits list. And you speak very much about identifying the things that are really important. And the only way you do that is knowing yourself and knowing how to date. So when you talk about knowing what you're looking for, what do you mean by that? I think it's really helpful And it was helpful to me to look at the things that worked for me in my marriage and some of the things that didn't. And I made a list of the things that I really loved about my marriage. And there were many things. There were also dissatisfactions. And so I was looking for more of a sexual spark than more than just being really good friends and loving each other. That was important to me. But I also valued so much in my marriage, my husband's kindness, his ability to talk with me intimately, to be a good parent to our children. And those were things I wanted a good guy. There are many good guys out there. We'll talk about that later. I believe it. I've seen it. I've lived it. There are there are good guys out there. The other thing was my husband was an attorney working crazy hours at a big firm. And I wanted somebody who would make a relationship a priority who wasn't into that kind of work frenzy all the time. When you speak about knowing what you're looking for, do you think that you look for different things over 50 than you might have looked for when you were 25 or 30? Because for me, my needs, desires, wants have changed so much. I'm now 65. They've changed so much. Do you find that people do look for different things, Francine, over 50? For love after 50. I talked to probably 100 people who had, in fact, found it. And we're part of a new couple, married, not married, all kinds of arrangements. And so many people told me that what they looked for in their 50s and 60s was completely different. You know, you're at a different stage of life because you're when you're young, you're looking for a partner to have children with, probably to make your fortune with. You might be looking for somebody ambitious or somebody who would make a great father or someone who has, you know, really good financial sense and, you know, and practical things that will help you make a life together. But when you're in your 50s or 60s, people say, I didn't want anybody exciting and ambitious. I wanted somebody who had my back, who understood that my mother had dementia and what that was like, or somebody who understood that I lost my child and this is forever a part of me. And somebody who would be a lot of fun and with whom I could do everyday things and we would share that. Very different. So in Love After 50, you write about 
maybe reconsidering categories which are must-haves, our list of required traits. And you write about reconsidering certain assumptions that maybe we had when we were younger. You had to have a certain kind of job. You had to have a certain look. You had to be culturally similar. And you talk about maybe you should just readjust that, reconsider it. Yes. Along with all the people I talked to who found happiness and love. I talked to people who were still looking and complaining that it didn't exist for them. As one woman, lots of women said to me, where I live, there's there's nobody, I've already dated everybody who's appropriate. And I thought, okay, appropriate. What does that mean to this person? Well, it probably means, and people said this to me, I want somebody who has at least as much money as I do so that we can afford to do, take the same kind of vacations together. I want somebody who has the same degree of education. I want somebody who's the same religion. Oh, I wouldn't date across racial lines. That's an absolute no-no. Oh, I wouldn't date across political lines. I mean, I wouldn't even consider that. And that may or may not work for people. But the thing is, I have found that when people didn't check all those boxes, got to be X, 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 that they open themselves up to meeting so many different kinds of people. And they often, over and over, I heard the, this, the sentence, I fell in love with somebody I never could have imagined I would have liked or been with. I don't know if you share this view, but I, I always think most people who are rigid about their desires and the traits that they require are fearful. You know, I think fear is the reason for a lot of things in life. And I think there's a fear of letting go of, they have to be the same religion. They have to have the same amount of money. They have to, have to, have to. I think it's fear. And when you let go of that fear, you really could enrich your life. Well, I think fear is part of it, but I think also people grow up with certain assumptions, what they have to find in order to please their parents, their social circle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, by now, there's a good chance your parents are dead. And even if they're not, you don't have to please them in this way anymore. It's your life. And people don't always re-examine the assumptions that they've always had because they've always had them. Sometimes it's just habit. That is a big focus of Love After 50, just sitting down, taking a hard look and re-examining. I think that's advice that would be well taken by people looking for love after 50. One of the ways, Francine, and you write about this, that people look for love after 50 is online. Now, I don't know about you, but when I realized at 60, I was going into the dating world and I had to go online and I'm pretty sophisticated technologically. It was like a bizarro world to me. It was bizarre. And it is a little different for people of a certain age versus young people who grew up doing everything like that. What has you been your experience in your research about people getting comfortable with online dating? I think that most of the people that I interviewed, not all, but most of them did meet their partners online. Some of them gave up for a while. It was too much for them. And I have a whole chapter on, it's not. It's more than tips for dating online. It's understanding that world and how you have to do it and how you have to look at it and, and have a sense of humor about it and get through all the, forgive the expression, bullshit and get to what you really want. Because if you know how to winnow away the chaff, there are really some great people out there. And it gets easier to find them because you know that if somebody just writes to you and says, hey, gorgeous, this is not a person you want to respond to because they're saying, hey, gorgeous to everybody. You want to get a nice, a, a nice, respectful email or letter or text, whatever it is from somebody who's read your profile, who actually might be interested in you and vice versa. And when you talk about understanding that world, for people over 50, understanding that online world, what advice would you give them that? And, and I know you write about it, probably reading your book would be the best advice. But if you could give us some suggestions as to how to understand that world. Understand that there are many, many, many people online. And it, to some extent, it's a numbers game. Don't be overwhelmed by the numbers and have a sense of humor when something looks promising, and then you're disappointed. Because people have so many options, very often they may be corresponding with five people at once, 
And then something takes off and they just totally ignore you and the other four people that they were so interested in. And that is just the nature of the beast. It's not personal. Don't feel rejected by it. Sure, it's a little disappointing, but also try not to live in fantasy and get two emails from somebody and say, this is the one. You don't know whether it's the one. You don't even know whether there'll be a fourth email, which, by the way, I don't recommend. I think people should exchange a couple of texts or emails, have a phone call, decide whether they want to meet for coffee. Finished. Do not get involved in, if you want a pen pal, fine. But if you want a relationship, do not do that. There are people who will never meet you, but will write you wonderful letters. Be willing to have 10 or 15 or 20 first dates. And if you get tired of it, stop for a while and go back later. One of the things that I tell people is when you first join a dating site, and I use Match.com a lot because it's the biggest. A lot of people will write to you because they have been on for a while and they've seen the same profiles go circling round and round and round. And they say, oh, so they've seen that one, seen that one, seen that one. And then you come on and honey, you are fresh meat. And suddenly all these people write to you. It's exhausting for a couple of weeks. And I would say, use that time well. Don't discourage anybody who seems remotely promising. You know, send them a little note saying, I can't talk right now, but I'll get back to you. Save those emails because pretty soon you will be old meat like everybody else. And you may want to go back to some of those people and say, uh, my time is loosened up a little. Would you would you like to talk? So there's certainly disappointments, exhilaration with first dates, with dating. And that's about the person you're dating. It was interesting to me that you also write about looking at yourself dating as a realist. And and I have to say that was a hard thing to read because it really involves holding up a mirror to yourself and all your flaws. And it's kind of humbling at a certain age to do that both emotionally, psychologically, physically, to really look at who you are and be a realist about dating. What do you mean when you say date as a realist? What do you mean by that when you write about that? Okay, two things. One, do not tell yourself negative myths that people say, oh, there's nobody good out there. It's too late for me. Nobody will want me. There's a whole litany of things people, you know, use to discourage themselves and to sabotage themselves. So I urge people to look at the reality. Yes, you may not find somebody who looks like a movie star and is richer than God, but you may find a really nice person who could make a wonderful partner. So scale back some of the negative things, but also scale back the fantasies of romance and glory and look at what's possible and be prepared. Of course, there's going to be disappointment. But, you know, I say to anybody, who's in their 50s or 60s, has been divorced or widowed, honey, you have survived far worse than somebody not calling you back or somebody or not having a third date with somebody. You are strong. Okay, it stings a little if somebody you're interested in isn't interested. Okay, let it go. A couple of weeks, a a week, you'll be over it. You know, Francine, I, I know for myself that it was humbling to feel hurt over dating or a date or something that didn't work out or somebody who I thought was something they weren't. And it was hard at a certain age for me to let anybody in my world see that hurt. My children, I certainly didn't want them to see me hurt, you know, my business partners. So it's really humbling to be able to be that hurt and to go through that. But you're right. At this age, we've survived so much. What's a little rejection? And don't think of it as rejection, because rarely is it about rejecting you. I mean, certainly with with the first and second dates, it's about chemistry. And chemistry is mysterious. It either works or it doesn't work, and you have no idea why. It may be that you find this guy incredibly attractive because his eyes crinkle like your father and he makes the same kinds of jokes. Or it may be that somebody just falls in love with your dimples or the way you toss your hair like his late wife. You just don't know what it is. And it's either there or it's not there. I guess that's the psychology of dating over 50, right? We have to be aware that it all comes into play. 
all of it comes into play. It's not about this person has evaluated me and rejected me. It's like the chemistry is there or it's not there. Yeah, I think what happens is as you date more and more and you find somebody who is your partner, you realize why did I even think that that was a possibility that one a year ago? You realized how inadequate that re- connection was for yourself, right. never mind for them. You know, you have to go through it to learn. And it's amazing to me that people over 50 looking for love still have this almost childlike or teenage like fantasy of perfection. And we hold on to it. I don't know what it is that we hold on to, but we still have it, which is curious. Well, some people have it. A lot of people who have been through bitter divorces and had therapy and learned from it and had many relationships do not have that fantasy anymore. And they're, they make, I was thinking of one woman who wanted to be so much not like her mother, who was so superior to her father and ground him into the ground, basically cut off his balls. So she thought, okay, I'll find a man that I really admire who's better than I am. And she found this guy who is a novelist and she found him fascinating. And she said, I thought I would be his muse and we would be as one. And it turned out he was awfully narcissistic. He said, yes, we were one. And he was that one. That's yes. a good story. But when she went looking for a relationship, and she had many until she found her her partner, one of the most important things was to have an equal relationship. Because very often when we think, okay, I'm going to have the opposite relationship from my parents' marriage or the opposite relationship from my first marriage, people make the mistake of they, they err in the opposite direction. So this woman Her parents had an unequal relationship and she formed an unequal relationship. Only this time she was in the subservient role. What's curious to me, and I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this. Again, I've been divorcing people for over 40 years. So I've seen a lot of people through the ends of relationships and, you know, you get connected with people and you see how their lives unfold over 40 years, which is the best part of my job because it is hopeful. And my experience has been that if people really want a relationship over 50 in particular, they will find one. One thing that I believe really sabotages a new partner, a new relationship is staying with the bitter divorce. You spoke about that because divorces can be bitter or they cannot be. Sometimes we choose that they're not. But staying bitter, in my opinion, will be the one thing that will make it very difficult to find a new healthy partner. You're absolutely right. And in Love After 50, I talk about getting in touch with your anger and then letting it go. Because very often people, even though they were the one who got cheated on, they were the one who, you know, was was abused, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What they feel when the spouse leaves them is shame. Like, how did I fail? What did I do wrong? And they also are embarrassed in front of their friends who they think they held up this marriage as the perfect marriage. Usually it turns out their friends didn't think they had a perfect marriage. One of the things that helps them recover from shame is getting in touch. There are many things which I talk about in the book, but one of the things that helps with shame and with depression is to get in touch with their anger. But They also, at a certain point, have to let it go. There was a divorce lawyer that I quote in the book, and I'm sure you've probably heard this as well, who said, you know, I ask my clients, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And a lot of them say, I want to be right. That's right. Those people have a world of pain ahead of them because one of the things you have to do, no matter how awful your partner was or what terrible things your husband or wife did is to understand, and this is the hardest thing, to figure out what your role in it. Because there are always two people in every marriage. And maybe your role was to do nothing, to let it all happen and not stand up for yourself. Maybe your role was to be a little sarcastic or not supportive. But when you figure out what your role is, you can begin to let go of some of that anger and have a realistic appraisal of your part in the marriage and your husband's part in the marriage. Because although it can be very alluring to think of yourself as a victim, I'm on the current and I'm going to throw myself in front of the train. I'm the heroine of my tragedy. It does not lead to happiness. Your words are ringing so true because, you know, being a victim is a really lonely place to be and not taking responsibility for 
who you married and why you married them is a really lonely place to be. In my introduction, when I started doing the podcast, I committed to not talking about the end of my marriage, but figuring out why I married him in the beginning. And also admitting my role and admitting that it wasn't happy. And boy, you don't know me, but it was really important for me to have a postcard family. I love that everybody thought we were happy. We were miserable. I was miserable. So we, we, <laughs> it's true. I mean, he's since passed away, so I could talk about anything I want to, which is a little easier. But I immediately let go of that anger because I got it. I shouldn't have married him. Shame on me. And when I admitted it was a little bit of an illusion and I was invested in that, it was extraordinarily liberating. And it's when I was able to eventually form healthy relationships. Admitting it is, is uh, you know, the human experience. Being humbled, it's a gift. Yes. None of us is perfect. Whatever the relationship was, and this is often the case with people who are widowed, because after I was widowed the first time, I was thinking, well, widowers are going to be the best people to date because they haven't been divorced. They've had a happy right. marriage. So I, I was able to search online and find it widowers. And I dated a bunch and some were very nice, but there was no spark. There were a couple who'd had miserable marriages. One was tormented by guilt because he cheated on his wife. The other one was actually separated from his wife. He'd been miserable and then she died. You know, and, and then there were others who so idealized their late wives that no, there's no room for anybody else. I don't know if it's dating a widower or a widow or somebody's been divorced. What I see is if you date somebody who has resolved their conflict and made peace with it, that could lead to a healthy relationship. That's been my experience. I absolutely agree with you. The important thing, you can be widowed and have learned a great deal about what you need in a relationship, or you could be divorced even after a horrible marriage and learn a great oh. deal about what you need in a relationship. I always say I'm thankful. I'm so thankful I had my marriage. I'm so thankful that it ended because it gave me the chance to live and really understand what was important to me. A little old, but it all worked out okay. Well, you know what? You're still alive. That's You're not too sure. old. And I, yeah, absolutely. You know, we talk about, you talk about in Love After 50, the first date, the mixed emotions, navigating that. Because let's face it, at a certain point, our hearts have been through a lot. And you talk about revealing yourself little by little over dating. How do you do that? How do you suggest that happens? Because what I've learned is when somebody completely sort of vomits up their whole life on the first date, that's not a good thing. So dating, revealing yourself little by little and navigating those emotions is something you write about. First of all, you have to, I mean, you have to be with someone you think, you can trust. And it's a mutual thing. Does the person you're dating, you know, respond to your questions, start, to, you know, speak honestly about themselves and their lives? Or do they blame everything on their ex-spouse? Do they blame their boss for, are you know, there are people who blame everybody but themselves? You can listen to people and learn about them. And you don't, as you say, vomit up your whole life. You Reveal yourself bit by bit over a series of dates. First of all, the dates are continuing and you learn about it over time. And also, I have a whole chapter on having the best sex of your life. Oh, we're going to get there. Oh, we are yes. going to well, get What I mean, what's important is to learn to trust the person before you go to bed. That's critical. And I want to talk about that. Before we talk about that, I want to ask you this. After you're dating somebody two, three, four, five times, I'm of the mindset, I'd like to spell things there. It's probably the lawyer in me. I like to know exactly what does this mean? Are we exclusive? Are we not exclusive? So how do you feel about, and what's your advice about getting that on the table? We're in a relationship, we're dating other per people, talking about it. Well, monogamy is very important to me, but it's especially important if I'm planning to go to bed with somebody. And this requires some preparation. First, I have to know that I can trust this person with my aging body and the things that work and the things that don't work. And he needs to know that he can trust me. You know, he can't get an erection or he has a disease that makes that impossible or whatever it is. But also, I believe in safe sex. People over 50 are getting STDs at the highest rate of any age group. So I would say that before you go to bed, say, listen, this is the only, it's important to me if we're going to be sexual, that we be exclusive. Is this something you're willing to do? 
Yeah, well, they're tough conversations, but if you don't have them, you become extremely vulnerable and confused. And I think it interferes with the intimacy that you experience because you're sort of questioning. So, you know, I'm a big believer in having the conversation, talking it through. I've talked about that before on the podcast and understanding the boundaries. So everybody's at the same, at the same page. So let's talk about sex. You write about sex in your book in Love After 50. And you say, you know what? You're poised to have the best sex of your life. So I have a question. How is that possible? I mean, let's face it, over 50, over 60, over 65, our bodies might not be what they used to be for men and women. Talk to me about being poised to have the best sex of your life. I believe that too, by the way, but I I was so curious about that chapter. I love that. Here's the thing. When you were young, Maybe you had like movie sex. Very few people have movie sex where it's always fabulous. You always come. Your partner is incredibly tender with you and gives you exactly what you want. And you never fake an orgasm and you always have one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in a good marriage, very often you've worked out a really nice sexual life. But when you're older, you and you may or may not have talked about it very much. Well, I think that's an age thing, too. I think that our generation when we were younger, I mean, just didn't talk about it as much. But when you're older, you have to talk about it. I'm going to give you an example of a couple in their 70s, true story. Um, They've had four or five dates. They're in her house on her sofa. They're making out like crazy. And he breaks away and he says, listen, there's something I have to tell you. I have a vascular disease and I can't get an erection, but I can give you pleasure. And she said, that's great because intercourse is too painful for me. And these people told each other, showed each other what gave them pleasure. And they had a great sex life. And believe me, men need to learn it's not all about the penis. Because a lot of older men discover that there are so many other parts to their genitals that they can feel ecstasy from that they just love it. Which have been your experience with women of a certain age? Because our bodies do change too. And although it's not as obvious, it could be challenging. How do, how do you navigate that? Well, I think you're up front. And if you can't have intercourse at all, you say so. If you can, but you need a lot of lubrication, you say so. Or if the guy's taking Viagra, and when I was in my 50s, a lot of guys took Viagra, and I found it was like being beaten with a stick. It was like so hard <laughs> and it and they could go on forever. In fact, they had to go on forever because it took longer to achieve orgasm and it was painful. So I'll say, listen, um, you know, some women like it to go on forever, but, you know, faster is hey, better. Viagra, let's do it the old fashioned way. Let's hope for the best. <laughs> right. The, the reason it's so good is that it's so intimate, is that you're communicating about it. You're admitting, I have this thing. You know, I need this. I need that. And he, you're both doing it. Well, I also think that if in your, as you get older, you are more willing to explore your sexuality. I mean, if you've been in a long-term marriage or not, or in a series of short marriages, as you get older, you think it's now or never, you know, Uh I'm going to explore this and figure this out or it's not going to happen. So, you know, under the title of what the hell, I think people who are a little older are more exploratory with their sexuality. What's your experience with that? I agree with you. There are some people who are stuck and they're losing out. But I think that when people are in a new relationship, especially, you have to change yourself to deal with a new person. This guy can't have an erection. Okay. He knows what he likes, but maybe I can help him find other things that he likes. Maybe I need to show him what to do with his fingers or his tongue. Talk about communication. I mean, that is because communication leads to intimacy and intimacy leads to good sex, whatever the sex is. And intimacy leads to communication. It's a, it's a virtuous, it's a virtuous circle. One of the things that you speak about love after 50 is you had two marriages And now you live with somebody. So marriage, living together, being committed and not living together. It's very confusing to me. I don't think I'd ever want to get married. I don't know about living together. I love having a partner. I don't know. There's a lot of confusion about, do I have to be married to show I'm committed? Do I have to live with somebody? So if you would share with us your thoughts about that and why you decided to have a committed relationship differently than before. There was a chapter in Love After 50 all about this, about living apart, living together, being married, not being married. All options are open to you. It depends on 
your psychological situation, your geographic situation, your financial situation, and just your preferences about space and time. And so I would never get married again because I have set up my financial situation in just such a way that I can manage the life I live and uh, there's money I want to leave to my children and all of that is set up. I would not want to marry again, even if I married somebody very wealthy, because I could wake up one day and that person is gone. And I had to figure this out. After my my second marriage, it's like, okay, I have this big apartment, but I don't have a second person to help me pay for it. And I had to downsize. And I thought, I never want to have to do that again. I want to find a place that I can be in until they carry me out, that I can afford and still be able to leave something to my children. And so marriage was really off the table for me. As far as living together, Michael and I started wanting to be together more and more and more. And he was at my apartment like five days a week. And then suddenly it was like, okay, might as well be here all the time. I don't have the biggest apartment in the world. And we have some issues about space and his stuff and my stuff, but we work it out. And it's wonderful to go to bed together every night and wake up together. Yeah, and it's it's no less a committed relationship. Oh, no, it's no less committed. But there are people who feel the other way, who are just as committed and just as happy. But this one woman said, you know what? You know, her apartment is like something out of a magazine. And her partner is like, could live in a closet. And she likes her own space and she doesn't want somebody, it's not that big, she doesn't want somebody in it all the time. And so they switch up. They see each other three or four times a week. You know, they vacation together. They talk two or three times a day. It works for them that way. So you have to figure out, it's not confusing. As you learn the person and learn their circumstances and think about your own needs, financial, emotional, physical, then you decide what you want. Which leads me to something else you write about in Love After 50. Whether or not you're married, you live together, or you're in a committed relationship, you don't live together. If you're going to have a truly committed, intimate relationship, there are things that you have to talk about, particularly over 50. Caregiving, if you need it. Finances. Children from prior relationships. These are discussions that one has to have, particularly over 50, because those issues are more present in our lives. How do you advise people to go about that? Openly, carefully, realistically, and with compassion for each other so that one person may want to live together and the other person not. One person may have been a caregiver for her late husband and not want to do that again and say, what's your situation? If you need care, do you have financial resources? Do you have insurance? How do you imagine this will happen? Because I'm not going to be a hands-on caregiver for for you or for anyone again. But that's a very important topic over 50, particularly over 60, 70. If you're not addressing caregiving and what happens if somebody gets sick, you really are going to find yourself, I believe, in a situation that's going to be uh, confusing, upsetting, and difficult, particularly if there are children involved from prior relationships. So the caregiving, I believe, is such a critical conversation to have uh, because anybody can get sick at any moment. This is true, and I believe it's really important, and I've done this, to have all the required financial documents, which you as a lawyer can spell right out, but who has the power of attorney? Who will be my health care proxy? For me, it's not my partner. It's my children. But it's also good to have that conversation. So uh, one may say, my children are my health care proxy, but I want to waive And I know this is something that I've given a lot of thought to. I want to waive the right. I want my partner to be in the room with me if I'm, you know, in a hospital bed. Of course. Or, uh, you know, if we're traveling together and somebody falls and breaks an arm, I want to be able to go to the hospital. So there's, you know, documents you could fill out to allow those things. Got to be realistic about that. And you don't think about that when you're 30, but you have to think about it a certain age. Yes, you do. You know, you really do. And you have to think about... If somebody passes or gets sick, you don't want arguments with children. You want all lines of communication open. I actually think you should talk. I mean, I talk to my children about this. You should talk to your children about if this happens, that will happen. Yeah. I have done that with my children. They understand. I said, if if I should die first, I want you to understand Michael is a part of our family. 
and he will be struggling and will need all the kindness and compassion. He will need a certain amount of time to be able to stay in the apartment, which you are going to inherit. And I've written this down and this is the way. And they've said, of course, mom, of course. I know, but hearing that, and it's a topic people don't like to talk about. I mean, uh, we have a whole department here that does estate and trust work. And it's amazing how people don't want to talk about dying and yet everybody does. (laughs) <laughs> or just, you know, everybody dies and nobody talks about it. You know, we always say marriages end in one of two ways. You either get divorced or somebody dies. It's going to end. Right. Uh, that's absolutely right. And um, I definitely recommend t- talking to elder law or states and trust lawyers, you know, and, and of course, um, marital lawyers about creating prenups and postnups and uh, yeah. all uh, things that take into account. If somebody moves into your house, does that person have a right to stay or not? You know, all of these things have to be spelled out. It is particularly important at this age. Well, Francine, I I am so appreciative that you've taken the time to speak with us. Having read Love After 50, being well over 50, I can say that if anybody in our audience is looking for love, I think you agree with me, Francine, they'll find it. But we all need a little help along the way. And this book is really worth reading to help you on that journey. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito. 